Testing, testing, one, two, three, four. Okay, this is the second of our compare and contrast lectures here. Um, so, let's deal with the early 1800s and take ourselves up through a few topics <coughs> to review for the period before the Civil War. Okay, let's start with religion, religion and culture. Remember, all of this stuff is very interactive um, in the sense that, uh, you know, people's religious values affect their political attitudes, their political involvements, uh, affect culture, you know, so these things are not in isolation, which is why we study all of them. Okay, so let's compare and contrast quickly the two great awakenings. First Great Awakening actually happens before the time period we're talking about, so don't get the two of them confused. First Great Awakening is 1730s, 1740s, and starts in New England. It actually starts over in England itself with George Whitfield, Whitefield, down here. Um, I have first there because he's really the, the first minister who was launching this thing. Uh, comes over to uh, the United States, and it starts in New England, but it spreads throughout the colonies and really encompasses all of them. We have this term, the New Light Ministers. The New Light in religion was this emotional response. Um, uh, George Whitfield, and then followed by Jonathan Edwards, were um, trying to bring people to uh, tears and joy and shouting and, um, you know, that sort of revivalism that you see on, on TV evangelist kind of thing. That new light thing was in stark contrast to the old lights. If you had gone to a congregational service uh, in the um, uh, New England church, in 1700, it would have been a very rational service, calm, um, reading from the Bible, and then a rather detailed exposition uh, in the sermon, um, uh, really a kind of exegesis. Exegesis is a um, religion word. I'll spell it for you here. Exegesis which means analyzing a piece of scripture. So it was really, you know, sermons were more analytical. Um, emotion was something that was a little bit suspect, uh, and everybody kept it very cool. It also meant that the, that the um, minister had a great deal of authority, um, and there were clear denominational differences, and people answered to the authority from them. So the Anglican Church had its ministers and bishops. Um, the Congregationalist Church had its ministers and, and you know, everybody kind of knew their place. With the New Lights and this tremendous emotional response to religion, it was a real challenge to the status quo. They, I mean, just as a, as a symbol of this, when the church parish leaders of the Episcopal or Congregational ch Church were um, uncomfortable having the the uh, Great Awakening preachers physically in their churches. They would meet out in the fields in the countryside. Um, it was a challenge to the existing established churches in the colonies. Uh, and it created a cross-denominational force. The people who went out to the to listen to the New Light preachers were you know, you didn't ask, well, are you a Presbyterian, are you a Anglican, are you a Congregationalist? They were all just, you know, true Bible believer Christians, and um, that was a force that was beyond the control of an individual denomination and also broke down the barriers between the different denominations. So there was a kind of toleration or uh, a loss of importance, if you will, of the distinctions between the various Protestant denominations. Now remember, there were almost no Catholics in the colonies at this point, and the Catholic Church, for theological reasons, would not have 
recognized or been at all comfortable with this. So we're and and this has nothing to do with non-Christians. So we're just talking about interdenominational, inter-Protestant denominational toleration. <coughs> that was um, an important aspect of the first great awakening. Why was it an important thing? Because it tended to start to break down uh, barriers between Americans. Um, it was a, a, a movement across denominations, across classes, rich, poor, farmers, workers, and across sectionalism. We remember that the American colonies were very sectionalized. The South, the Middle Colonies, and the New England colonies were really rivals in many ways and saw themselves as distinctly different cultures, and in some ways they were. But the Great Awakening was a, not the, but a part of the beginnings of this sense of an American identity beyond just being, well, I'm a Massachusetts colonist, you're a Virginia colonist. What do we have in common? You know, um, I mean, think of it this way. England had colonies all around the world. They had colonies in Bermuda. They had colonies in Hong Kong. It's completely different, right? So they had colonies in Massachusetts and they had colonies in the Carolinas. For m people in this continent to start to think of themselves as having more in common with each other than with England. That is, I'm from Massachusetts, I have more in common with somebody from Virginia or Carolina than I have with somebody in London. That was a new idea, which obviously is going to help lead you down to the American Revolution. Also note that women became more active in religion and the churches as a result of the Great Awakening. Okay, now let's flip that to Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening happens in the early 1800s. So, First Great Awakening is well before the Revolution. Second Great Awakening happens um, after the Revolution. It starts in the 1790s. There's not really an end date for the Second Great Awakening, but it's kind of... Um, it's transforming into other things, let's say, by the 1840s. This one, in th First Great Awakening starts in New England, Second Great Awakening starts in the West, along the, the frontier. Now remember, the West, in the mid-1800s, is, um, you know, you're still talking about, uh, in the early 1800s, I mean, uh, you're still talking about um, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, out on the borders out there. Um, the Louisiana Purchase will only take place in the early 1800s, and it doesn't really start to get settled till much later. So the frontier is really out in that area between the Appalachians still and the, um, and the Mississippi. And it spreads back from the west to the east coast. Um, one example of this, it's only one example of it, is upstate New York. Upstate New York was so um, uh, affected by so many preachers passing through it and stirring up congregations, it comes to be called the Burned Over District, um, as if a, a, a fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit, had swept across like a wildfire across um, the western part of upstate New York, out by Buffalo and Rochester and that area. The ministers during the Second Great Awakening, the preachers, were largely um, Baptists and Methodists. Uh, Charles Finney being one of the key guys there, really um, probably the most identifiable of, of the preachers. And whereas the first Great Awakening is all about an emotional response to religion, the second Great Awakening is more about um, the responsibility of doing things to morally perfect oneself. It's about a spiritual rebirth, which has an emotional aspect to it, but it's also about self-improvement. Um, perfectionism 
uh, you we put you know we look down on perfectionism. Well, he's such a perfectionist. Here we're talking about sort of spiritual perfectionism. Your goal is to be to lead a perfect life, to become ever more moral, ever more upright, and that's going to have great effects out of the Great Awakening because with that idea <coughs> that the human person can be perfected through their spiritual life and that we have an obligation to improve ourselves and to make everyone else more moral, that's going to lead you to the reform movements that come out of it. The anti-slavery movement, um, the abolitionist movement, kind of comes out of the um, religious movement of the Second Great Awakening, the temperance movement, right, the anti-drinking movement. Uh, a lot of the social reform movements come out from this idea that we have to perfect the world and perfect ourselves. Um, there was a lot of millennialism in the Second Great Awakening. Millennialism meaning the millennium, the, the second coming of Christ, that Jesus was, was coming back and coming, and there was a strong sense that he was coming back any moment. Um, and, you know, so we had to get everybody ready for it. One of the, th there are a, a bunch of smaller religious movements that come out of the Second Great Awakening. One is the Seventh-day Adventists, which I'm sure they won't ask you about on the AP exam, but it gives you a sense. The Seventh-day Adventists, are born because um, there are a couple of guys who decide that Jesus is coming again and they give a date. You know, everybody be here on October 21st. And they really believe that he was that imminent. Um, there were a number of Protestant sects that are born from that. I also point out here that the Mormons, the Mormons are not Christian in the usual sense. Um, our understanding is, you know, there's three persons in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, come among us as a human being. Mormons have a very different understanding of who God is and what Jesus is. So I put it in parentheses here, because it's very hard to class them as theologically as Christians. However, they come forth from this sort of hyper-religious enthusiasm. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, came from that burned-over district in New York and was so caught up in the emotionalism of religion that it, fa it led him to start believing that he was receiving his own revelations and form his own, um, his own faith. Uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as he called it, um, which everybody else called the Mormons. Okay, and as I point out, the Second Great Awakening really leads to a lot of these reform movements. But note, women were terribly important in the Second Great Awakening, which is part of the reason, uh, women, particularly middle-class women, which is part of the reason why women become such a driving force in these reform movements. If we look at abolitionism, and the temperance movement, and the women's rights movement, as we talked about, they're all sort of bound together, and they all are, are interrelated. So, there you go. Two really quite different things in many ways. The First Great Awakening, this emotional response to religion that helps forge an American identity. And the Second Great Awakening, an emotional response to religion, but but the sense of um, the ability of human beings to morally perfect themselves and the obligation they have to, to undertake that in society, um, coming along as it does in the early part of the Republic. Okay, let's move to the next topic. The Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, happened to some degree in response to what was seen as a loss of Christianity in the country. Um, the 1700s, late 1700s, and the early 1800s saw the rise of these two 
movements, deism and transcendentalism, which are very not Christian. Not that they're anti-Christian, but they're, they're very not Christian. And so the Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, was in part a response to that, um, to a, a sort of backlash against it. So let's talk about these two, deism and transcendentalism. Deism comes first. Deism, co uh, de uh, obviously, Deus, la a God, right? So it's a belief in a vague notion of a higher power beyond us. Comes really from Europe in the 1700s, comes out of the Enlightenment movement. And the idea is God as the divine watchmaker. If you think about all of humani all of reality, yeah, as being this w perfectly running machine, yes, and you guys are taking physics, so you know one way to think about the universe is that it just seems to work, as we say, like clockwork, like all of these gears and wheels, perfectly humming along, following perfectly their mathematical rules. So the deist kind of saw God as this divine being about whom we really can never know anything, but who caused all this to be, who set the rules, the orderly laws by which the universe works, the scientific laws by which we work, kind of sets the universe in motion and then walks away from it. So just as, as a finely built, you know, watch of the time with all the gears and springs in it, uh, the watchmaker doesn't stand there making it run. He simply builds it and then it off, off and it runs on its own and he has nothing more to do with it. So they thought of God this way. God is basically uninvolved. They didn't think of God as a, a personal God who listens to our prayers exactly, but who set this orderly universe in motion. Human reason was our ability to discern, to figure out the laws by which the world and humanity and therefore things like economics and politics should run. Just as scientists were beginning to figure out how the solar system worked and you'll have um, Isaac Newton figure out calculus or fluxions as he called it, called it. So you can apply that same human reason to interpersonal relationships to society, to economics, to politics, to discover the perfect laws by which all of this should run like a great big machine. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were both very much deists. Um, Jefferson famously wrote the Jefferson Bible, where he took the Christian scriptures and he admired Jesus, both the Franklin did too. He, they both admired Jesus as a kind of nice guy, and philosopher. And they went through the Bible and they took out every reference in the Gospels to anything um, miraculous, anything divine. You know, it, what if we rewrote the Gospels and just had Jesus as a regular human being who said nice things? That was kind of their attitude toward religion. The Masonic movement, the Masons, the Freemasons, also largely come out of this. Um, they were f the, the Masons was, as we've talked about, I think, just a club um, of men that used um, Masonic, uh, the, the symbols of stone cutters, as sort of um, uh, symbolic analogies, right? And they talked about God as the great architect of the universe. That was their fir their term, and they believe that human beings, men who became masons, could become morally perfect uh, simply by discovering these human rational laws. <coughs> well, okay, that's it sort of denies a whole half of humanity. It denies our spiritual nature, it denies our emotional nature, and so you have the reaction to it. Not, first of all, the reaction to the Second Great Awakening, uh, saying you've lost your Christianity. But second, transcendentalism. 
transcendent, something beyond us. Transcendentalism was, as opposed to deism, American produced. It really happened here. 1830s through about 1850s. Eh, those are fuzzy dates, maybe 1820s through 1850s, depending on where you want to start it. And the Transcendental Movement was a philosophical movement and was as literary as it was philosophical. Most of the Transcendentalists were not only thinkers, but they wrote poetry or they wrote um, novels um, because a large part of Transcendentalism was about discovering the transcendent values of things like beauty and truth in beauty. Nature was very important to transcendentalists. Nature, not just in the deist sense of, oh, let's look at the physics of the universe, but nature in the sense of the beauty of the woods and the forests and the animals and all of this. Transcendentalism was, the, the spirituality behind it was based on intuition rather than reason. Imagination and emotion were important, not just reason. They got very interested, many of the transcendentalists, in the Eastern religions, Hinduism in particular, Buddhism, like that, looking for looking for spiritual answers if you've already decided that you're going to reject Christianity for whatever reason and you're going to reject rationalism well now where do you go and so they got very involved with the eastern religions I think there is something to be said that they didn't really understand the eastern religions that much but they liked the beauty of it you know the art um, the exoticism of it I think attracted them by intuition and beauty and simplicity of life, they thought human beings could discover spiritual truths. And so it's through literature and art and that sort of thing that they, that they seek the spiritual side of human beings. Literature, important books to know, are Walden, Walden by Henry David Thoreau, which is his rather detailed and beautiful descriptions of a year that he spent living in a shack that he built himself by the side of Walden Pond and all of the living as a kind of monastic hermit um, to be in touch with nature and, and he describes in great contemplative meditative detail you know the coming of spring in the lake and what he saw and the creatures in the forest and all of this sort of thing. The other thing here, the Dial. The Dial was a kind of magazine that Ralph Waldo Emerson um, put out that was a place where a lot of the um, transcendentalists published their thoughts, their works, and so on. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Margaret Fuller really are the the most representative members of the transcendental movement. I put in here utopianism too. Utopianism, the word of course, which we, I think we've talked about in class, utapas, it comes from two Greek words, not place. Um, they'll never ask you this on AP, but the, the, the word utopia actually first shows up with um, St. Thomas More. St. Thomas More, the Henry VIII's Chancellor wrote a book called Utopia in which he describes a sort of perfect society. You know, it's he makes up a theoretical country and then builds a perfect society there to talk about his ideas about law and education and so on. The tra th th That's completely tangential to this. The utopianism here is some of the transcendentalists tried to form communities built on their ideas. And so, for instance, in Massachusetts, you had a place called Brook Farm, for instance, which were these little colonies they set up that were, you know, their idea was like to have a colony of, of philosophers and writers who would sit around all day living as simple farmers, 
and spending their evenings sharing their poetry and philosophy. Well, that doesn't usually work out so well. Uh, most of these people didn't really know how to make a living, um, didn't really know how to work a farm, um, weren't great at that sort of thing. And you, folks like this, you, te you run in very quickly into disputes and conflicts and philosophical arguments. And so the utopian movement is fascinating, but it also was short-lived and fell apart pretty quickly. I put down here some other names, therefore. Louisa May Alcott, Orestes Bronson, came out of the transcendental movement. They actually participated in that utopianism for a while. Uh, Louisa May Alcott, of course, the author of Little Women, Orestes Bronson, became a, an important social thinker of his day. Nathaniel Hawthorne, whose name you should recognize from American Lit, um, was part of the Transcendental Movement, lived at Brook Farm, and was part of the utopianism, and then afterwards kind of has a bitter reaction to it and writes a couple of satirical, snarky pieces about sort of how young and dumb and naive he was when he got involved with them. That's why I put these guys in um, parentheses. And down here I also put in parentheses Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman was not, I don't think, w w you would class him really as a transcendentalist. But he certainly came from that same stream of thought. Um, that, uh, that there is a spiritual side to humanity that we are meant to tap into by emotion, by art, by beauty, and by intuition. So influenced by them, we'll say. Okay. So we see the comparison contrast there, I hope. Next. Ah, uh, okay. Let's get back into politics. Early 1800s, leading up to the Civil War, is the era of the Great Compromises. Remember that the, I mean, I, 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 this should be stupid, painful, obvious to you by now. If, if you don't know this that I'm about to say, then really uh, you have no business taking the AP exam. Um, Constitution had left the issue of slavery off the table. Even the Declaration of Independence, as you should painfully be, not, you know, know with painful obviousness, uh, when they wrote the Declaration, there were movements in the Congress, particularly from Adams and Jefferson, to put a clause into the Constitution basically ending slavery. It was part of Jefferson's hypocrisy, I say with a question mark, because Jefferson's too complicated a guy to put a label on him. On the one hand, he owned slaves. On the other hand, he moved for their abolition, but then he didn't get rid of them himself once he had a chance to because he couldn't figure out how to make a living without them. Anyway, they try to put it into the Declaration of Independence. The southern colonies put the kibosh on that. So as a way to get the Declaration of Independence passed at all, the issue of slavery is taken out so that the South will go along with it. Constitution comes up, same thing. Um, in fact, the three-fifths compromise in the U.S. Constitution, where a slave is counted as three-fifths of a person, <coughs> was put in, not by the South, to, to again humiliate slaves, but was put in by the North, because if you counted slaves as people, even though they couldn't vote, it would have given Southern um, plantation owners even more power. Think of it this way. If you have... I'm making up a number, a million people in South Carolina, of whom um, half a million are slaves and half a million are free whites. They get twice the representation in Congress for half the number of voters. They don't get voters for 500,000 people. They get voters for all one million, even though 500,000, the slaves, can't vote. So you're putting a lot more power into the hands of southern states 
based on their slave population, you give them an incentive to have more slaves. Um, and, but the decisions are still being made by the rich whites. And the northern, col the northern states in the Constitution weren't happy about that. So the best they could come up with was a compromise where each slave wouldn't count as a whole person but would count as three-fifths of a person, which gave the South still some advantage but cut down to some degree on the population advantage they would have for that. Um, anyway, uh, slavery was otherwise left out of the Constitution because um, they couldn't come to an agreement on it, and they wanted to keep the country together. And so it has, uh, slavery was called, has been called, America's original sin. It was the, um, it was the, the big terrible thing that we ignored with the Declaration and the Constitution in order to make the country happen. Okay, well it helped to make the country happen, but the issue was going to have to get dealt with at some point, and everybody kind of knew that, but everybody kept putting it off. So in the early, early 1800s, you had the Missouri Compromise. 1820, the North had a higher population, so they had a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, which is based on population. The Senate, everybody in the, every state gets two seats in the Senate. So in the Senate, you had 11 free states and 11 slave states, exactly equal. Missouri, Missouri Territory applies for statehood and wants to be admitted as a slave state. The North is not happy because it would give the slave states a majority in the Senate. And the Senate is the more important of the two houses. Henry Clay comes up with a... Um, we're going to talk about Clay, by the way, later, but just hold it. Henry Clay comes up with a compromise. <clears throat> we'll admit Missouri as a slave state. But we'll also admit Maine as a free state. Now, Maine is up in the northern tip of the United States. It had been a part of Massachusetts, but they wanted to be their own separate state, which made sense because they were somewhat distant from Massachusetts. So Clay says, well, what if we admit Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state, which keeps the balance, keeps the status quo, and we will set a line. 36 degrees, 30 minutes. Um, north of that line, in the Louisiana Purchase Territory, no new slave states will be admitted. And south of that line, we can admit slave states. So that was the line that kind of defined what north, where north started and where south started. That 36, 30 minutes. You can look online for a map or it's in the book so you can see exactly where that is. But point being, okay, we'll keep the balance. Um, one slave state, one free state, so nothing changes. We'll set a line so that that'll keep the North happy, that there won't be any more slave states in the North. But notice that the argument here is political and economic. The North doesn't want the South to be extending slavery to these new territories. Why? Because they don't want the southern slave states to have more political power in the Senate, and they don't want them to be using all of that free labor among slaves, which is going to damage the labor market and the business market in the North. So it's political and economic reasons. They're not really arguing about the morality of slavery yet. The Missouri Compromise holds from 1820 to about 1850, when we get the Compromise of 1850, which happens in 1850. Duh. Same situation. North had a majority in the House. Senate is evenly divided. By this time, it's 15 free states, 15 slave states. California asked for admission as a free state. That would have tipped the balance to the North, and the South didn't like that. So Henry Clay and Stephen Douglas, 
we remember Stephen Douglas from that will happen later with the Lincoln Douglas debates. Um, Henry Clay, Stephen Douglas come up with this idea. We'll admit California as a free state. Okay. We also have these other territories out west that are not states yet, Utah and New Mexico. We will al allow them popular sovereignty. That is, the people will get to choose whether or not they want to be slave or free. So we'll, we won't make the decision. We'll leave it up to them. So California gets, so where the North gets California as a free state, the South gets the possibility of Utah and New Mexico to keep the North happy. Clay and Douglas propose that the slave trade be abolished in District of Columbia. The slave trade, not slavery. So you could still own a slave in D.C. You just couldn't buy and sell them there. So if you went to North Carolina and bought a slave and you took them to D.C., you could keep them. But um, District of Columbia around Washington had some of the biggest slave markets in the country. And okay, you can't actually buy and sell them in D.C. Now, why D.C.? Because District of Columbia is federal territory. It's federal land. It's not part of any state. So in federal territory, you couldn't buy and sell slaves. That was the giveaway to the North. What's the giveaway to the South? The Fugitive Slave Act, which says that if, you, um, if a slave escaped from the South and got to the North, um, they, it, it, you had to help pursue them, capture them, and take them back. Compromise of 1850 holds the country together briefly. Notice, though, that during this debate, now we've begun to make moral arguments about the morality of slavery. Abolishing slave trade in D.C. was not about economics and was not about political power. It was about the morality of slavery at all, and it was one little way to chip away at the slave trade. The Compromise of 1850 lasts only until 1854. 1854, you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Stephen Douglas is behind this. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is really about clearing the way to build the Transcontinental Railroad. And they want to open up the territories in the Midwest, or what we would call the Midwest today, um, to settlement, to farmers. So the question of admitting Kansas and Nebraska to the Union comes up. The Kansas-Nebraska Act allows Kansas and Nebraska to apply for statehood and leaves the matter of slavery to popular sovereignty. Again, the people there will get to vote. That sounds like a very nice idea. Except the problem is that when you do that, human beings move. So the problem with the Kansas-Nebraska Act was Nebraska wasn't quite ready to apply for statehood yet. It won't apply for statehood until after the Civil War. Um, Nebraska is admitted in 1867 to the, to the Union. Kansas is ready to go, and everybody knows that there's going to be a vote in Kansas as to whether it's slave or free. So what's going to happen? People start moving into Kansas to try to influence that vote. So right next door to Kansas, you have Missouri. Missouri was a slave state, and the so-called ruffians, that's what they were referred to as, the ruffians from Missouri, who were pro-slavery, came flooding across the border either settling in Kansas or settling there temporarily or just coming across planning to vote whether or not it was particularly right for them to be voting to influence the election. Well, with the ruffians from Missouri, you also got the Jayhawkers, as they were called, from the East Coast. These were all the anti-slavery people from around the country who came down to 
Kansas to camp out there and they would influence the vote. John Brown, we know, who later became the guy who raided Harper's Ferry. You should know him. You should know who he is. Um, this is where he gets started. He and his sons... Uh, uh, John Brown is really a religious nut. I mean, he he thinks he's a prophet. He thinks he hears he's getting messages from God. And he and his um, sons uh, become this one family army that goes around... Uh, Kansas raiding places and actually causing a lot of death and destruction. Kansas of this period in 1854 is referred to as bleeding Kansas um, because you had basically this mini civil war taking place within Kansas between the slave uh, forces and the free forces and it was a bloody war. They beat the hell out of each other. They raided each other. They shot each other. There were a lot of people killed over this. Finally, the vote is taken. The, the vote was filthy dirty. There was ballot box stuffing all over the place. There was intimidation of voters. But the vote turns out in favor of admitting Kansas as a free state. And so Kansas is admitted as a free state. Nebraska is kind of put on the back burner for the moment. And this is really what marches us then down to the Civil War. Because um, it, it's going to trigger the crisis of the election of 1860. Which gets us then to politics. Let's talk for a minute about The second party system, as it's sometimes called, and its shift to the third party system. The first party system, of course, were the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans. The second party system are the Whigs and the Democrats. The third party system is the Democrats and Republicans. So let's compare and contrast these parties briefly. The Whigs. The Whigs... Um, are largely born from Hamilton's Federalist Party. By the time you get to the early 1800s, we're early 1800s now, the Federalists have kind of gone out of existence because the questions that, they're fa that they had faced were sort of settled. So the country goes from Federalist, Democrat, Republicans to what are called the Whigs and the Democrats. The Whigs largely born from Hamilton's Federalists, so therefore what? They want a strong federal government. In order to have a strong federal government, you need a broad or loose reading of the Constitution. Hamilton, his Federalists, and anybody who's in favor of a strong federal government has to see a lot of implied powers in the Constitution. Right? Things that it doesn't specifically say, but logically the extension of it is that the federal government has this, that, and the other power. They were in favor of the National Bank, which by this time is the second National Bank, the second charter on the National Bank, to centralize the banking system and put it under federal control. They were in favor of Henry Clay's American system, which is that system of, of infrastructure. We talked about roads and canals and stuff that the federal government was getting involved in on the excuse of um, boosting the national economy by boosting transportation and communication. The Whigs tended toward social reform. Um, they hated Andrew Jackson and that whole spoils system thing from the, um, the Jackson administration. They were against the Indian removal, that is the mass forcing of the Native Americans, the Indians, um, out of the lands on existing states and pushing them, pushing them, pushing them uh, west, 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 and moving them on to very specific reservations. They were against that. They were also against the Mexican War. Remember the Mexican War? It was James Knox Polk, um, and it was part of that American expansionism, that manifest destiny stuff. 
If you don't know that, please go look it up and make sure you know something about Manifest Destiny. I can almost guarantee that it will show up in some fashion on essay questions. Um, anyway, they were against the Mexican War and that kind of expansionism. Who were the Whigs? Well, they tended to be business types, um, small businesses, but also the big business owners, the newly emerging factories that were coming out, professionals like lawyers, um, doctors, um, school teachers, professors. Uh, I also, I didn't put here, but notice, also a number of the large planters in the South. Um, the um, you know, people who had a stake in national and international trade tended to be Whigs. The most notable names are Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. The Whigs disappeared by the 1850s. Um, they were already kind of having some trouble, but the Kansas-Nebraska Act we just talked about so split the party up over the issue of the expansion of slavery. Should we allow it in the new territories or not? That they, they basically become irrelevant and they dissolve. Okay, second party there is Democrats. Democrats really come from Jefferson's Democrat Republicans. And therefore, what do they want? Very limited federal government. Strict constructionism of the Constitution. Reading... You know, the federal government only has the authority that is literally said in, said in the words in the Constitution. So where does the government power go? Well, to the states. Strong advocates of states' rights. They opposed the central bank, and they opposed Henry Clay's American system. Um, because the federal government shouldn't get involved in such things. On the other hand, they were very supportive of westward expansion and Indian removal. Um, these tend to, the Democrat Republicans tend to be in favor of anything that makes more farmland because um, they're very agriculturally based um, and expansionism because to them uh, expansionism gives them more power the expanded areas are more likely in their view to be Democrat Republican uh, to be a Democrat um, and therefore you know they're all for it. Who are the Democrat Republicans? Now, again, this is not universal. Remember this when I say these things. If you were a factory owner, you weren't. there was no legal bar to being a Democrat. And if you were a poor farmer, you were not forbidden to be a Whig. But we're talking about largely, right? Democrats tended to be the poorer farmers, not the big landowners, but the little guys. Laborers in the city, not the factory owners, but the factory workers, <clears throat> and a lot of immigrants. By this time, by the time you get to um, the 1850s, uh, you have mass Irish immigration and German immigration, and a lot of the Irish immigrants tend to be Democrats, uh, particularly in the big cities. So things like the Tammany machine in New York, right, the, these corrupt political machines in New York City were, were Democrat-based. The Democrats remained on through the Civil War. Uh, they were split over the war that should be not over the war. Um, you had a fight o between, you know, you had the Free Soil Democrats um, who didn't want to extend slavery, but that didn't mean that they were in favor of abolishing existing slavery. You had the pro-slavery Democrats, and you actually had some abolitionist Democrats. So there was some split among the Democrats in the lead-up to the war, but largely the Democrat attitude was um, sympathetic to the South. And even during the Civil War, the Democrats were the ones who tended to... Um, want to end the war and negotiate a peace. So you had the peace Democrats, you had the war Democrats. There were, there were Democrats who supported the war, but there were also a lot of Democrats who were um, against 
the Civil War or wanted to end the Civil War quickly. Okay, so then these all contrast with the Republicans. When the Whigs fell apart by the 1850s, who was going to arise as the opposition to the Democrats? Well, a new party, born partially from Whigs, partially from Free Soilers and others. Basically, the Republican Party arises in 1854 as a, an anti-slavery party. Now, be careful because the Republicans themselves were against slavery but had a range of attitudes about it. Some were out-and-out abolitionists, wanted to end slavery in the whole country immediately. Others were free soilers who said, let's not touch slavery in the South, but we'll stop slavery from extending into new territories. And we'll kind of stand by and watch because slavery will will fall apart by itself. There was a good argument to be made that if nothing had been done, slavery was eventually going to become um, economically no longer viable. And so you had Republicans who said, well, let's just cool it, let's just lay off. Um, but the one thing that all Republicans agreed upon is that they didn't like slavery and it was a bad thing. The question was how you, what you did about that. 1854, the party really gets organized, um, and uh, you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. They run a candidate in the 1854 election, um, I'm sorry, in the 1856 election, John C. Fremont, uh, who was one of the great explorers of the West. Fremont had been, you know, explored the Rocky Mountains and trails out to California and all that. Uh, and as I mentioned in class, his campaign headquarters in the 1856 election was actually right here on Staten Island. It was down in Stapleton. Um, their attitude was free labor, free land, free men. Free labor meaning no more slavery and, you know, pay working guys to do your work. Uh, free land, that's something that's a little forgotten today, but the Republican attitude was that the big plantation owners were gobbling up all of the property. Every time property came up uh, available in the south of the new territories, it was the big plantation owners who were gobbling it up. So they wanted to split the land up more so that the little guy could get his piece. And free men, you know, it's a nice slogan. The Republicans soon dominated the northern Midwest and the northeast. By the time you get to the 1860 election, therefore, Lincoln is elected, um, and a majority in Congress is now Republican. However, if you look at the maps, you see Lincoln was elected by the North, and the majority of seats in Congress were still held by the North and the Upper Midwest. So it was a very regionalized thing, and of course it's the 1860 election of Lincoln, that triggers um, immediately the Civil War. South Carolina refuses to go along with this, and in early 1861, just when Lincoln is being inaugurated, you have secession. Okay, so hopefully this was helpful to you. If it's not, or you have questions, ask them. I am available again after school uh, just about every day I am there, um, and you still have on the website that open forum for you to ask any question you want that has to do with anything in American history, and you can answer each other's questions, you can all brainstorm together on that forum, I will throw in answers, but you can amplify and discuss them and dispute them even, um, but you should be working on this material now. Okay. Uh, so this takes us to the Civil War, and then I will post another one of these for the post-Civil War period, um, hopefully tomorrow or the next day.